This episode of Nuff Said is brought to you by Tweaked Audio. To get awesome headphones, go to tweakedaudio.com and use the coupon code SOUTHGATE to get 30% off, free shipping, and a lifetime warranty. Or you can get there through the link on our website, southgatemediagroup.com. Recording has started, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome and with me, as always, is the man, like me, Phil, Phil, me, and Pat. I was going to add something there, and then what oh, well, I don't know your dramatic. No, 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 no you were right. To pause because I might have said something because I wanted to, and I didn't. See, Phil, he it's. Phil's life is chaos when I'm around, and I, I I should do my best to limit the chaos, but somehow I only increase it. Uh, <laughs> see, he's so understanding. He is such a nice guy. You should have a friend like Phil Perich, let me tell you. Phil, fill me in, Perich, the man who fills me in on all the things I do wrong. Okay. Oh, no. <laughs> on that note, hey, Phil, how do I sound? Good. You're, I sound better, okay. Do I sound better on the cell phone or do I sound better on the computer? That's a, that's a question I'm having. It's like you know, I listen to these shows back to back, and you, the audience, can write in and tell me. Did I? Because uh, super connectivity. After the start of it, I'm on my cell phone. I mean, and did, now I'm on the computer. It's so. probably close. I mean, if I if if one's better than the other, it's probably by a hair. I mean, you sound good right now. So I mean, okay. As long as I sound good. Yeah. For, for whatever reason, I think when I'm doing the Skype, I sound muted, even though it doesn't sound like it on my end. Mm-hmm. Whenever I listen to the podcasts for me and Maz, I sound much more muted. I have to get him into Hangouts, but then I have to figure out how you record from a Hangout and how you hang things out. I don't know how to hang. Uh, anyway, let's talk about the wonderful world of Captain Marvel. Yeah. It is Captain Marvel Week, kids. Get your fan theories in now. Get your words properly marked because it all ends on Friday where all the spoilers are out there for everybody to see. And we all feel disappointed that our brilliant idea was not the one chosen by the writers four years ago. Okay. Um, uh, little little news. Um, Rotten Tomatoes has decided they really don't care if you want to see a film anymore because... <gasps> Too many jerks, too many jerks, too many jerks are making a point to say, I don't want to see this film. You see, originally the idea was that, oh, we should see who wants to go see this film. And so you would click on and say, I want to see this film. And then some people would say, oh, I'm not really that interested in this film. It has a normal up-down metric. But there are trolls who make it a point in their life to be afraid of women with in anything and have decided that uh, girls should not be allowed to play with uh, cosmic powers and made it a point to say how much they don't want to see this film. And granted, you can make this argument that, well, you know, that's fair. If there are a lot of people who don't want to see this film, it's fair for them to say they don't want to see this film. However, I think that you get into this problem where if you're actively, if, if you're making it as an active point, and more importantly, if you're, creating meat puppets to do so, then you're just kind of a lame, lame loser. And really, exactly the kind of person who needs to reassess everything about your life, because it is gone yes. poorly. Uh, just my opinion. I don't know I could be wrong. Um, but like I said, that's Captain Marvel. Uh, Rotten Tomatoes is getting rid of the do you want to see it button, because honestly, who cares? Really? The you know the do I want to see a button? That's Fandango. That's the that's that's I'm going to pay extra to make sure I get a ticket ahead of time. So you have two meters for do you want to see it? One is uh, people who buy their tickets ahead of time to pay extra just to go see a film from where I think she's doing pretty well. I think her pre sales are very high. And then you have the actual did I want to see it? Yes, this is how much money this film made. This is why Aquaman, even though it was a film I didn't want to see, I had to see. <laughs> <laughs> did very well. If I had sat there and like said, oh, I think Aquaman's going to be awful, or or I read the script and I don't like it for this reason, and now I'm going to create a bunch of meat puppets so that all of you understand how vehemently I feel, 
Well, that's really not that's that's not sportsmanlike. That's what I'd say. That's not sportsmanlike. Oh, I, th- okay. I think I mean it's an MCU production, so I mean I, I don't think it could be that bad. It's gonna be. It's, it, I, I would bet. I would bet anything I have that's gonna be better than any DC pro. You know. Yeah. I. I. I well, here's what I'll say. If she says to someone that Mercy is in the ocean, uh, <laughs> which when she starts off, she is. She or, is or, or save yourself. <laughs> yeah. Whatever it was he said. Yeah. Yeah. yeah just, why did you say that name? <laughs> Because why did such, you say that name? Because Martha is such a uh, rare name. <laughs> no, no, it's actually talking to Phil. Phil, why did you say that name? Uh-huh. Uh, that would be funny. That would be hilarious if at some point, um, you know, if someone said, "Why did you say that name?" It'd be like it's something random, and she says, "Why did you say that name?" Like, well, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, oh, oh, Martha, and she's, like, "Why did you say that name?" <laughs> oh, well, that's that's a person. You know, I know. She would find this funny. I would say, oh, okay, well, that explains that very quickly, and we didn't have to fight about it. Uh, <laughs> that is an after credit scene. If they ever go back to comedy after credit scenes, which they which Marvel doesn't do, but as a child of the 80s, I always loved those when they do the blooper reels mm-hmm. yeah, after Cannonball Run. We all love Cannonball Run. Cannonball Run 2, Electric Boogaloo, also had that. Uh, so... Getting back to uh, Captain Marvel. So, uh, like I said, this is the time to get in your fan theories. And there was a very interesting fan theory. Now, it has been confirmed by Annette Benning that she is the Supreme Intelligence, correct? Yep. And then our good friend over at, uh, good friends over at CBR unearthed an interesting tale recently mm. about what the original plan for... Ms. Marvel, uh, which is what she, Captain Marvel named Ms. Marvel, um, cause she used to be Ms. Marvel, now she's Captain Marvel. Uh, her very unpopular pregnancy storyline. Oh yeah, well that's, well I wonder if that part of that too is that they had to switch course, cause I guess originally they wanted her to have been impregnated by the Supreme Intelligence, but. Well yeah, so apparently what it was was, I guess, and this is one of these moments where I'm going to look at Jim Shooter and I'm going to say, you know, Shooter, I think you made the wrong call. Mm-hmm. Um, because apparently what it was was they had just done a what if story. Yeah. Because the idea is is that in this story, th- the Supreme Intelligence wants to make a human Kree hybrid. Yes. Um, and he's going to use Carol Danvers to essentially artificially inseminate her, again, against her will, so still very rapey. But I think maybe in that story they deal with it in a much more prog- positive way other than what they wound up doing. Mm-hmm. Um, although, who knows? He might have just been, nah, just the same story. Just said the Supreme Intelligence. I just had this guy make her fall in love with his head. Uh, <laughs> uh, to give himself a body. Uh, but apparently what it is, and in fact that might have really been the crux of it, that it was he wanted to have that body. Mm-hmm. But apparently, they had done a similar story of the of the Kree Supreme Intelligence putting his intellect into a body to expand beyond his realm. In a what if, where he takes the dead body of Rick Jones, who apparently died in the storyline, um, and he merges with it to become that. Now, this gets me thinking: Is that what is going to be the final thing that makes Carol turn against the Kree? Is realizing that she has that basically the idea being that maybe she was sent to the Cree using the Cree technology, which we've already seen in Agents of Shield, the teleportation technology like the Obelisk, which we know is around in the nineties. And they send her in there, she dies wherever it sends her. Hmm. And then the Supreme Intelligence sort of resurrects her to make her into this Cree hybrid, but with the intention that and that Benning is the big bad of this film. She wants that body. Yeah. And maybe she merges with the Supreme Intelligence. Maybe she doesn't merge with the Supreme Intelligence. Maybe she gets a major power upgrade when she gets it. And then it's about her fighting the Supreme Intelligence. Maybe she winds up with, maybe it's a situation where the Supreme Intelligence bonds with her, but then she finds, but then the Supreme Intelligence finds itself a junior partner in the relationship. Hmm. Uh, that maybe Carol's humanity is stronger than the Supreme Intelligence. 
Um, and that's what we get there, and that she gets this superpower upgrade, and storylines progress from there. Well, I told you, my big theory is, like, you know, now we have precedent in the comics that her mother was Kree. It's mm-hmm. like, so we were talking about, oh, you know, is the Supreme Intelligence going to appear to her as her, you know, in the visually as her mother? What if the Supreme Intelligence is kind of her mother? What if it is? What if the Supreme Intelligence is female, you know, and that yeah. is her actual mother? Well, I mean, that's an interesting question. Now, here's a here's a neat take on that. The Supreme Intelligence is the greatest leaders. Is It's the merging of the minds of the greatest leaders of yes. all of prehistory. What if, what if Carol's mother was someone who came to Earth, but she was also a great warrior or leader? Maybe the story is, oh, my mother died. Well, and, hmm. and, then she, and then because, like, getting buried in the wall of the Kremlin, her honor upon her death as one of the great warriors of the Kree society is she gets put into the Supreme Intelligence. And that's why she appears as her mother. Well, that's what I'm thinking, too. That's, that, was, that was part of my theory, too. What if instead of a giant green floating head, what if every time there's a new ruler of the Kree, like the memories and the minds of like all the past rulers get like uploaded into their head or something? Oh, well, so you're assuming that Annette so, Benning is a physical being. Yes, what if they're all physical beings, but, you know, they go with a c- part of the theme of the Supreme Intelligence, they just get all the knowledge of the previous rulers uploaded into their head somehow. Oh, that's an interesting idea. Um, I think you have a storage capacity issue that, that's hard to get around, but, you know, I personally like to, but since it already said in the in the novelization you looked at that oh yes, it appears as yeah. what in a different form, but it wouldn't surprise me since we're using, you know, uh, youthening technology any, anyway. If we don't get a young Annette Benning in here somewhere mm. as the great warrior of the Cree, you know, leadership, you know, yeah. and honestly, the idea of you know, just because they just because they're not sexist doesn't mean they can't be Nazis. Uh, <laughs> so the idea that you're going to have a uh, <laughs> that's the great thing about Nazis is you can actually. Totally like one person that most Nazis maybe aren't down with, but you can still be a fascist Nazi even if you like this one group of people that other Nazis are like not down with. Yeah, you know? no, we're the progressive Nazis. We're the ones that like these groups. You know, uh, that's sort of like the entire idea of modern Hydra in comic books is that they're they're not Nazi Nazis because they like these other groups, but they are still very much Nazis because they want to control people. And kill people who they deem unworthy of life. You know, th- this is basically it is a you know Nazism is sociopathology uh, writ large, um, and you can make that a racist ideology, or you can just make it any other ideology. Any ideology given over to sociopathology will lead to mass extinction. It is it is the universal slavery of reason. Once you have determined that there's only one outcome then you must exceed that outcome. That is sociopathology. It is called sociopathology because you are unable to master trinary reasoning, which is the idea that it's not all this or all that. There's actually a third way, and we have to find that way, and that is what social social interaction is about. So if you're not sociopathic, if your social understanding is not pathological as a detriment to you, uh, then you have a proper social understanding, which is that you understand it's not all one thing. Hmm. And can I just take a moment? Because I do want to, because I did mention who you are, um, uh, and I do want to mention that uh, Mercer in Orville shows himself to be every bit as great a captain as any. Mm. Yeah. Uh, spoilers for this, at the end of it, there is this very sh- strong discussion of what do we do with Isaac? You know, yes. we imprison him. We, you know, they want to put him on trial. Now, Isaac didn't actually kill anyone in this, even though he is the emissary and technically an enemy. And Mercer makes this very great point that because, and again, this is about the the parallel that we have in here. Mercer makes the point is we can't be what they think we are. Mm, yes. Even oh, yeah. as we, yeah, even as we see that the Kalons, because they are bound by the universal slavery of reason, to only be able to comprehend things in this binary fashion. 
Because, yeah, because the Admiral, uh, a.k.a. Professor Stein, uh, wanted to put a, yes. an on-off switch in uh, Isaac. And, yeah, that yeah, that's what Mercer said. He said, like, no, we can't do that. That's exactly what started this whole thing in the first place, is their race, tra- you know, their builders yeah. tried to uh, enslave them. Exactly. And that is the idea. Is if you And here's the thing, is I think that this is, and again, to, to get to Rob's point about worrying that, so much of Orville may be, may rhyme well with Next Generation, this is, I think, the Hugh conundrum. Yes. Which is, what if we send a, what if there is a individual among the Borg? Yes. And what if that sense of individualism is actually so much more detrimental to the Borg than any kind of mind puzzle that we're going to send them? Um... They were gonna, literally, they were going to try to destroy the bo- the Borg with a meme. <laughs> they were going to say, "Can you fi- do you know what's wrong with this statement?" Look at the internet. I don't know. Or, yeah, you know. Or or you have to post a draft now. Or or, um, or sleep data sleep. <laughs> yeah, but um, yes, uh, it, it is. But the idea is, and again, so there are these very real qualities that rhyme with it. But at the same time, I think also it presents itself a a a clear uh, uh it rhymes but it also improves yeah. that's the thing it is meant to it is meant to rhyme yeah it's it's like widow yankovic i think the songs are supposed to sound like other songs that you've heard before mm-hmm. but when he does his or his, what he calls style parody this is a style parody mm-hmm. widow yankovic will do a song that's a style parody where you listen to it like wait isn't this that song by that one band and then you're like, no, it doesn't really meet that. Because what he is, he is perfectly matching how that person writes a song, but he's presenting it in this new configuration and presents it as a, a very different take on things. I think, um, I think like the technical stuff, you know, the science fiction y stuff is similar, which it would kind of have to be. Mm-hmm. But I think the interpersonal stuff is like, deeper maybe than even next mm-hmm. gen and he you know you're going in different directions i mean i never i never saw a wharf with a porn addiction yeah <laughs> well yeah um although they did mention that that sexual relationships for klingons were very different yes um, they're very much into the s and m apparently um not that there's anything wrong with that you know consenting adults are consenting adults as they exactly. always say you know um but anyway, uh, <laughs> on that note, <laughs> on that note, oh, wow. supposed to be a drop, Phil. you're supposed to just push it. Don't waste time. Push a button on that note. <laughs> and, but uh, he likes to hear his own voice. Anyway, uh, you watched Gotham, you said, right? I did watch Gotham. And this is what I got. I, I, here's my, I think this was one of the, you know how they gave them like extra episodes? Yeah, that's what we were saying on Thursday night too. Yeah, this seemed like a filler episode because they expanded from ten to twelve episodes. Yeah. Yeah, it's like oh, okay, you know, and that because if you think about it as a writer, it's like they say, okay, we got ten episodes. Okay, okay, there we go, ten perfect. Ah, uh, you know, have a couple episodes. You're like, okay. Well, they gave them two extra <laughs> to get to even one hundred episodes. Yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. Which also, and if it is really that mercenary as the reasoning. Um, I mean, I don't know what other reason they would have because Lil said they're already at the number they need for syndication, so... Yeah, well, you know, you want that 100. Because you get a cake. <laughs> there you go. You get a cake. And they get that Gotham cake, it's going to be all gray, and they, get, they hire a guy, they get you know, one of these fancy guys who does the things, and he does the marzipan layer with the ganache for Gotham, the bat. Um, uh, this I'll tell you what this really makes you want is I want a Bullock Year One comic book. Mm. DC, I will put a Bullock Year One comic book on my pull list today. Immediately when I said that, because I, I was tweeting, I had to go search. Wait, is there already a Bullock Year One? There is not a Bullock Year One. I mean, I didn't uh-huh. see anything. I didn't see anything or hear anything about this, but I thought Lil said something about supposedly maybe they were talking about doing a comic book. You know, like they did with Smallville after that was over. I mean, you mm-hmm. can really dig into like Bullock and whoever else you know if you do something I mean like that. I would I would love to see I would I would I would I would get I would pull the Gotham comic I mean but like I said I would rather that they go backwards not forwards Yeah well <laughs> I would rather like I said I would rather and not honestly not for nothing I think Bullock and Dix mm, are yeah. 
a much more interesting set of characters that I would love to see that story expanded and explored. And I would love to see, and this is kind of the neat thing, is it? Because it kind of shows how, and this is one of the, it's a filler episode, but it's a great episode for the Bullet character. Yes. You know, uh, where we do get to see his own, his own path and his own things and how I'm trying to do the right thing. And maybe I didn't do it in the best way, but my job was to put a killer behind bars. And yeah, later I found out that, oh, that killer had, had, had a story, but that doesn't make them not a killer. And Mm. it is, it is this, this thing. And I think that maybe this is kind of this interesting thing when you look at Batman. Um, Because Batman really doesn't care about how rough the um, how rough the childhoods of the Velasquistas are, mm-hmm. you know, Jerome and Jeremiah. They had they had some rough childhoods. Um, now he doesn't care because you know the woman well, my parents were killed. Well, I was gonna say Bruce and I had would to be say, raised yeah, by it, a butler. Bruce would like say, to be raised like a butler. Well, Bruce would say you know a traumatic childhood is no excuse for becoming a monster. Yeah, but that doesn't really come well from. Bruce. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> I mean, he's not killing people now. Well, uh, that's what Daredevil used to say too. Uh, <laughs> and you know, we got our the what. And actually, what's interesting, what I liked about that episode. So, and I'm going to be a little all over the place. We got a lot to do. Someone took up the whole episode, the whole ep- last episode with ads. So we've got a lot to cover. Um, <laughs> but Daredevil number two, did you read it, Phil? I know you did. Yes, I did. I told you to read it. Yes. I know, yes. and I did, and it was good. Oh, yeah. Um, but it makes... Here's one of the things I liked about it, was they actually made the point that, yeah, Daredevil has killed lots of people. <laughs> but always unintentionally. But this time, he killed this person unintentionally, but it, uh, honestly, it's a weird circular argument that Daredevil is going through here. Because mm-hmm. we see throughout this, I'm a little off my game. I don't have this. I don't have that. But I would never actually kill a guy accidentally. Well, I think the whole thing is like after the whole accident with the truck, you know, his first grade villain, uh, yeah. you know, he's been in physical therapy. He's been going through pain. And like, remember the fr- in the last issue, like his, when he was facing those, when he was facing the thugs, like his radar sense was kind of wonky. So I think his, his whole thing is like, oh, someone's trying to set me up, you know, and it looks like, you know, that, I, I'm out of it or something where, you know, it's what, uh, accidental manslaughter or, you know. Well, in this case, it's intention. And in this case, it or, is second degree murder, I believe. Okay. Uh, because he is engaging in, it actually might even be first degree murder. I think that I, I am, I'm not 100% certain on New York law, but if you're basically, if you kill a guy in a fight, um, that is still considered first degree murder, even though you, you can say I didn't intend to kill him. Yeah. Well, what did you think was going to happen when you hit him with a billy club? <laughs> you know, really? No, really. Yeah. It's like you know, which is why, incidentally, if someone, if you want to go be a big man at somebody, never bring a baseball bat mm. because then it's assault with because then it, it is it, it is assault with a deadly weapon. If you ever get assault, is just when you threaten someone. Yeah, I think you'd be like, yeah, you know, you can't say it was accidental. You 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 plan something because you brought a weapon. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it's like his argument. No, I'm so good. It, it, essentially, the argument that I am really good at hitting people and not killing them isn't a good argument in court. No, I mean you'd have to go into the whole powers thing because supposedly, you know, he can sense stuff like pressure points, and yeah, supposedly he can be but very if he precise. Has to get on the stand. Yeah, yeah. Him, has anyone ever died accidentally before? He knows he's. That, that's the thing. So this yeah. is why Foggy's entire argument is 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 bad. Yeah. Because if he actually has to make any kind of allocation, yeah. And someone says, "Well, has anyone ever died?" Well, it, so actually, so before he'd be under oath, he would get to make a deal, and he could go from that deal. But part of any deal is you then have to state the crimes you have committed. Yeah. You saw this in uh, Lu- in Luke Cage, uh, season two, or was it season two? Yeah, that was season two. Electric mm-hmm. Boogaloo. Um, that if you intentionally withhold something, you lose the deal. This is what's going on with uh, that guy that just testified before Congress for, uh, against Trump. Yeah, that you know, if you withhold something, they say, well, now you've blown the deal. Mm-hmm. Um, 
But in this case, what we're looking at here is, uh, yeah, so there's really not an out for Daredevil except to prove his innocence. But I think it looks very bad for him. But obviously it's designed to. But, you know, there, there it's an interesting take on on the Daredevil, um, uh, basically what we saw in the, in the last season of Daredevil on Netflix, where is that he is beaten up and he's weakened. Um, and he's trying to reclaim that, but he's off his game. But even then, even then, in his defense, it would take a lot of pre-existing conditions to kill a man accidentally in that way. Um, because, you know, not for nothing, even a, even a human being, because he only has human strength, he's punching him, and it's not like he's necessarily going to cause that embolism. Although you can, you know. You can, it is possible, especially if you punch him and he hits the, if, and he falls the wrong way on concrete. Mm-hmm. Um, what struck me is, didn't he? No, I don't know if he actually mentioned that he was falling the wrong way. But you know, honestly, Daredevil comes off very poorly in this. In, yeah. in, in the sense, he looks like a guy who's desperate to prove he's, he's in it. But yeah, I don't know. It, that was Daredevil part two. Yeah, yeah, because the kingpin said he had nothing to do with it because he was he's yeah. dropping on him. I don't know. It's probably gonna be like Mister Fear, you know, Daredevil's poor man's Mysterio. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I was actually going to say, I, I thought it might be Mysterio, because I know that that was yeah. the whole, you know, the whole, oh, but, what if yeah. Mysterio tried to take him out because he's a second-rate villain, and he's a second-rate hero. Oh, <laughs> I love Mysterio's argument on that. Uh, yeah. But, yeah. Um, but, oh, wow. Uh, yeah, who knows? Who knows who's trying to set him up? But I think actually, yeah. Yeah. But no, I'm waiting. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> I, know, I was gonna say, I know, I know you want to talk Superior Spider-Man number three. Uh, power Cosmic. The Power Cosmic, and this is uh, so major spoilers. Uh, turns out uh, Otto is not destroyed by Terex, the uh, the Tamer. <gasps> um, Shocking. Yeah, I said spoilers beforehand. Yeah, I know. No, here is what is great about this. Otto does the right thing. Yeah, right? gives up the power because he says, "I know enough to know that no human can hold this power without it corrupting him." Yeah, doom. Not, not a, yeah, yeah, doom. We'll get to doom in a minute. <laughs> like I said, you know what I say you can't say Otto never lied. You know yep. that drop. If that dropout doom could do it, how hard could it be for a real intellect? Um, and not for nothing, yes, yes, that dropout doom did it, mm. and God, he is, uh, we'll get to Fantastic Four next, <laughs> but this is what I love about this issue, after the whole fighting, after we get this great scene of Maria and Ak working together, where basically once they've analyzed the power cosmic, you know, and not for now, let's not forget Terex, he, he's not the he's not the sharpest. He's he's not the brightest bulb in the garden shed. No. You know, he is um, not even the smartest yeah, herald of he, Galactus, he, yeah. He, uh, you know, he's like, wait, what you know what? Um uh, I think that Galactus kind of maybe wanted you know, he actually was kind of picked because he was a sociopath. Because he was a guy who people on his home world. Mm-hmm. And so he was like, uh, you know what? Maybe I'll get, maybe I should get a guy who's not like always. Oh, but he will need to die. It's like maybe I shouldn't find the most noble being. So he creates Terax, and, and that ended just as other heralds. I used to think the guy would say, you know, what? I don't think I need a herald. They're not very good. But um, you know, so Ak, you know, changes the nature of the um, of the uh, axe so that it like blows back at uh, Terax, and then he blows himself up, which is fun. I also love when he says, yes, I have the power of a person who controls stone. What do you think I'm going to do with that now that you're facing someone who's literally made of stone? But yeah. here's the thing. So Maria covers up for Otto, brings him to the location, says you got caught in the accident, which isn't a lie. And she says, oh, those Alpha Flight people took the power of Cosmic when they picked up Terex. But then we find out she says she's going to keep an eye on him, says it's his parole officer. And man, you know, if you, yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, because Peter vouches for him. Peter vouches for him. Yeah. Honestly, taking Peter's 
<laughs> I guess we have to. It is a Spider-Man book. So well, I mean, I mean, if nothing else, that's like the really the only other superhero Anna Marie knows is Peter. Fair enough. Fair enough. And and you know, and he and he is vouching for Ah. You know, so that mm-hmm. we're clear. We got a clean slate, and you know, so that. But you know, for those of you who ever shipped Hardcastle and McCormick, <laughs> um, and I know you're out there, folks. So this might be a good book for you because definitely there's going to be some, sh- you know, cause it is a Hardcastle McCormick vibe here. You know, he, she's his parole officer. He's released into her custody. And, you know, there, there can be more there. And, but we also see that Anna, bit of a supervillain, because she Ooh. does a classic supervillain move. She lied about what happened, and then she kept the power for herself, just in case. Just in case, Phil. Which, you know, you know what I always remember is, like, every time that any superhero who's also, like, the Hulk or the thing gives up their powers or loses their powers, they always like, well, I guess I have to get my powers back now so I can help the fight. You know, it's like, no, there actually are a hundred other people who do this, you know. Yeah, this might cause problems if you don't become the Hulk again, and maybe it'll become more detrimental to the world if you were the Hulk again, rather than you just let the abomination blow up this lab and then have the thing come in and beat him up. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, no, I, I kind of got to have that power. You know, it needs to be safe with someone like me, who's the best person with power. And Otto, to show he is a true hero, says, at no point does he says, my intellect is so great, I can handle it. Basically, after the whole Venom scenario, I think he's like, you know, I think all this idea of questing for that super omnipotent power isn't the best idea. You know, maybe I should use, I should recognize that I'm great and awesome just as I am and use what is my true superpower, my brain, to do what I need to along with these amazing spider powers I stole. All right, here's the, here's the big thing I think this story brings up. One, is Anna Marie mm-hmm. going to use that power? Is it going to corrupt her? And if it does, is Otto going to have to be the one to stop her? Well, yeah, I think, well, obviously. Bobby. Obviously. Bobby. <laughs> that is Chekhov's power cosmic. Mm-hmm. We have established that in the second act. Yes. That power cosmic is going to get used by the fourth act. I don't know the actual in place. Uh, we've established Chekhov's power. We'll call this the first act. So I think it's yeah. like if it's if you have a power cosmic in the first act, you got to shoot it in by the third act. Um, hmm? I think actually Chekhov actually says you have to shoot it in the second act. But you know, hey, he was a Russian. He's always he's always wants to shoot his guns. Um, <laughs> <laughs> My apologies to the entire Russian community who does not like to shoot guns. Although a few, I mean, so, so, I, I know one one Russian I know she likes to shoot arrows. So, um, <laughs> uh, anyway, but no, it is it is a uh, it is something that obviously is going to come back, and she is obviously going to use it, or it's going to get stolen, which is the other uh, other mm, option. Yeah, and she is it's like. Why did you keep that? You know it's dangerous. You said you gave it to Alpha Flight. They they could handle this, you know? Oh, that would well, be, be a big thing, too, because Otto would be like, you know, this is something you would yell at me for doing. Exactly. Mm, so so there's one of two options. One is she take she has to take on the power cosmic for whatever reason. Because not for nothing. Here's the thing. Anna Marie is a scientist. Mm-hmm. She's got this power cosmic sitting here. You know, it's I like Marie Curie. It's like, oh, this this rock, it's it's kind of hot and glowing, and what can I find out about it? And you know, it's I almost like that. Story. I almost like that better. Spoilers someone, to the Marie Curie story. I like almost like that better if someone steals the power, and then you know, once Otto f- figures out it's because Anna Marie kept it, if he's like, okay, this is something I would do now. Now, do you, oh, are you kind of are we kind of all on the same wavelength? Can you understand me more now? That you know, yeah, Philip. Big prediction. The hood feels the power cosmic. <laughs> Cause you know, he's been doing so and he's like he's been ah, you know, maybe he says, you know what, I realized I'm done with magic. But there's other ways to get uh, unlimited power. And <laughs> you mark my words, the hood is gonna still and because not for nothing, hood is a thief and he's a criminal. And not for nothing, I got the feeling that Horizon Labs does not have the best security. You want? I don't think it's it's not a Stark facility. You know, it's not like a, it's not like they expect supervillains to be breaking it. It's like Star Labs. How many supervillains break into Star Labs every week? You really, you you really want a a, a 
a, a big, huge threat that, you know, that would really, really prove Otto's uh, abilities. What name is he, is he keep bringing up? What about a power cosmic, what about a cosmic powered Graviton? Oh! Oh, Graviton steals it? Well, first time, Graviton already has cosmic powers. I know, but if he juices up even more. Oh, if he juices up even more, yeah. And that is that is certainly a a uh, Talbot level world ending event. Stop if, Thanos in his tracks, though. And, <laughs> it, and if and if Otto st- beats him on his own, imagine putting that on the resume. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, exactly. Uh, I mean, it's possible we, we did we did have Chekhov's graviton. Yeah. Uh huh. And we haven't had that crossover yet. Although although it's possible, it's possible that wasn't really graviton. Hmm. Because we saw that Graviton was actually Novar using an image inducer yeah. in the great book, West Coast Avengers. That's right. Uh, and do all the Avengers have to fight vampires now? <laughs> I know. I saw that. I was like, oh. You know, not again. for nothing. It's like, really? Uh, vampires? It's like, did, did, did someone send out a. Oh, vampires. We're doing vampires this week. Um, yeah. And Nova, he's very, very prejudiced against scrolls, which I, I like because let's face it, we do, we, we do want to hype our new scroll series, which is oh, where's the ad for it? Meet the scrolls. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, meet the scrolls is coming, and again, I think this is why I say I think we're going to get nice scrolls in Captain Marvel, because mm. I think the whole point of the scrolls is that there is not one kind of scroll. Scrolls are not all one thing. Cree, all one thing. Only good Cree is a dead Cree. But uh, no, that's not true either. Because you know, Captain, the original Captain Marvel was actually a nice guy. Yes, but I, I don't know. Yeah. Maybe unless Scrolls just evolved, they'll be like, "You think we're evil? We just had to kind of, you know, get uh, more cutthroat to deal with the Cree. The Cree or the, you know, the Hitler." Well, yeah, well, talking about. Well, exactly, and this, of course, is something we'll see in the Orville next week. When we come to the question of now that we've allied with the krill, oh. now that Avis be praised, Avis yeah. has brought us together. For what purpose only Avis knows. Um, what and it does look like the the krill are still there next week. It's not like the krill say, like, "Well, okay, we're done," and it's like, now what do they want? So maybe the krill are like, uh, you know, did we trade a did did, did we did we trade the 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 uh, the Kalons for the krill here. Uh-huh. Um, you know, there's the there's the the, the statement that of when you when you have this question, do you ally with um, when you would do you, would you ally with you know you should ally with Stalin to beat Hitler, but whether you should ally with Hitler to defeat Stalin is a much more complex question. I mean, is it going to be? I mean, are the Cree are, are the krill just going to want to kill them and they're going to be like, hey, you know, you wipe us out, buddy. Guess what? You're on your own against the Kalons, so. Well, no, the, the the krill don't want to wipe out anyone. Well, they it, want to... no, they 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 well, I don't know. Well, they'll do whatever if they think that's Avis's will. Well, yeah, well, basically, I, I I essentially the krill are the beings that would say we have no no problem with you continuing to exist so long as you are in service to Avis and thusly the krill. Yeah. So essentially. You know, they have made a deal with those that would enslave them against those who would kill them. Mm-hmm. And now they're... And so you may get in our third act of this season, because like I said, that was that was a mid-season episode, and that was their budget. I, I, I don't know, I, unless Fox is just saying, here, here, this is all Marvel's money now. You just spend it. Oh. <laughs> you know, um... You know, that was a very intensive episode, and it was amazing. Um, and, like, as I say, so well written. Yafit, who is so great. But, um, yeah, Yafit's going to have an arc the rest of the season. Because um, they took him out of just being one-note, dirty Norm MacDonald guy and actually gave him an, a point to act. Oh, yeah. Uh, he sent out the distress signal. He saved Ty. He did it all. <laughs> Yeah, and then you actually why like he saves the, well he doesn't save Ty. Wow. The other the other the other Kalon takes him, but he defeats one, which actually is how you actually say that. And then when you have like just after that, we're taking out the one Kalon almost 
kills Yafit. Mm-hmm. But he, of course, regenerates because he's he's protoplasm. It, it really is. It was a great moment for Yafit. This is a great episode for Yafit. Um, uh, so he has been thinking about reproducing. So that's a whole other thing. <laughs> Um, All right, back, another egg. Uh, anyway, back, to, but, back to comics. I want to hear you rant about Fantastic Four number seven. Man, he, oh, you know, Doom, you almost, Doom is so Doom anymore. They brought Doom back to Doom. Yeah, honestly. Well, it, again, this is why Doom is no Otto Octavius, no. and why Doom is a poor scientist. Because as Otto will be the first to point out, it's like, no, if something fails, you don't do it again. Because obviously that didn't work. And Otto is a guy who says, you know, I could take this power cosmic right now, but that would be stupid. Well, well what's the Because def- obviously it ends poorly. What's the definition of insanity? Keep doing it again and again for no expect good reason. Different exalts or expect different yes. exalts, yeah. And what he has done, and again, and again, we don't know why. Galactus is purple yet, right? I don't... Th- uh, oh. He was briefly turned... No, 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 because I was thinking about this. He turned purple in... Uh, the, le- in the Before they ended the Ultimates. Yeah. Because the in-betweener turns him purple after he kills the Living Tribunal or some nonsense. And... Except, you know, he's not the in-betweener. He, he's some other new character. Um, and... He turns, or maybe the Living Tribune turned purple. Anyway, turns purple. But then at the end of it, when they do bring in the actual, the original Ultimates from the Ultimate Universe, you know, you know, sort of semi-racist 40s cap and everything like that, they actually um, do turn him back golden, as I recall. By the end, by the end of the Ultimates, he was back golden. So he was the good Galactus, because he was the good Galactus when he meets. Uh, um, uh, Moon Girl. So I think I think that that I think that he I think the reason he's purple is because of Doom, and that's what's going to be the big reveal here is that he has been defeated. He has been fighting Galactus because he wanted to harness Galactus, mm-hmm. and now he has Galactus phased into Mount Doom, which is going to give him all kinds of crazy powers. And yeah, I think that. Um, I looked it. I looked it up. I had to refresh myself. Yeah, Galactus was turned purple again in uh, was it Infinity Countdown because to stop Ultron, they're like, oh, you need to like eat like Ultron had like a whole world basically, and they're like, you have to eat this world, and he's like, he didn't want to do it, but then once Galactus did it, reverted him, I guess, back to original form. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that was. Okay, so do plot device. Plot device. So, so plot device. Yeah, Galactus was yeah. purple again. Yeah. So a convenient plot point is convenient. Yes. Um, I like the retelling of Doom's origin with his father here. Uh-huh. Um, and actually, what's interesting about this is it actually suggests that his father was the scientist, was the genius, although he could not save uh, the Baron's wife. Uh-huh. Um, which again, big theory. His father is father is Nathaniel Richards. His grandmother's been lying that they're not really the descendants of the Von Dooms. They're not the they're not the barons of Doom. Because <laughs> if you're Von, then it means you are from Doomstadt, and it means you are the Burgermeister of Doomstadt, the Baron of Doomstadt. Uh, but he is he ain't. He's just time traveling fr- Nathaniel Richards. Get it up, <laughs> and uh, that is where you get uh, his father. Who again is this kind and dedicated and per- and, and wonderful man? Not unlike Reed Richard, uh, willing to sacrifice himself for his child. Uh, so actually, that would make Doctor Doom actually Reed Richard's nephew. Uh, no, and like my nephew, one of them is kind of a pain in the butt because he doesn't think things through in the way he should. But anyway, enough about my nephews. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah. Oh. yeah. I was going to say, you uh, did you also want to talk about Marvel Comics Presents number two? I did want to talk about Marvel Comics. I know, we're running late. It, it got me at the conference. There's so many good comics. I know. So we didn't even talk about Gunhawks, which I loved, or well, Captain America, which is great. Yes. I just know Home Road, No Road Home was okay. Um, yeah. I mean, I mean, it's not bad, but it's like, you know. Mm-hmm. Anyway, 
So, quick, quick thoughts about which one? Oh, Marvel Comics presents again. We get a, gr- and I'm gonna pull it because I like that Wolverine story, which is clearly our ongoing. Yeah. Because when you do these kind of things, you have one ongoing. Mm-hmm. Which apparently they didn't start in the first issue. So they apparently were, were waiting for people to come to the second issue. Wait, what? Because usually you'll, in a, there wasn't an ongoing in the first issue. Or yeah, was Wolverine. They have a Wolverine story? Yeah. Oh, Wolverine started in the first issue. Yeah. Oh, oh, so we got the first part of that. Okay. Yeah. Because so it's, like, yeah, it's, like, it's like a time jump where, like, yeah, this demon gets knocked out of this world, but it only it, it reappears every 10 years. So, yeah, the first Wolverine story was in the 40s. This one in this issue was in the 50s. Oh, we get to see 60s Wolverine with a big fro then. Great. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> I guess so. I want this for Wolverine. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, um, okay, so great. So, so, so that's. So that's good. So that's obviously our. But I want to see the rest of the story because it looks good. So, um, but yeah, but the but then the, the the Mr. Fantastic story. It was like it was basically set right before they got their powers, but it was still set in the sixties. So no, it was set in the fifties. Oh, fifties. Yeah, yeah, fifties. So I was like, wait, what? Yeah, because it's just a, well, yeah, well, because there is a universe where where the Fantastic Four started in the sixties. True. Yeah. You know, I mean, that is a real reality. You know, and that that the time. That time slides does not mean that the past time doesn't continue to exist. In fact, there's a great way to look at Marvel time with the idea of sliding time. It is not that the past doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. It's that we are not a stationary observer, although we think we are. So what we are seeing is we are seeing these stories as time slides from our perspective as a stationary observer in time. But the uni- but what we're really doing is we're traveling fourth dimensionally. Mm-hmm. Or possibly fifth dimensionally, uh, yeah, not 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 as big on string theory as it should be, but um, where we're seeing it looks like a continuous movement, mm-hmm. but the people are remaining static in time because what we're actually looking at is different time displaced variations on the characters. So there is actually there actually is a very sh- there is actually a, a cosmological explanation that you can exp- that you can have both a nineteen fifties uh, uh, Fantastic Four in a 1980s Fantastic Four, and have it make perfect sense. Even a, a, a Fantastic Four that first went up in the year 2000, have it make sense, mm-hmm. and have it all be connected in in this line because we're actually watching, we're actually seeing time spread out sort of as an arc. So it's like here is the original timeline, and then what we are because we are we're starting at this point, but what we're but we're moving this way as it moves this way. So what we're actually seeing. Is all these other points in between as we move on our diagonal? Okay. So, a little bit of uh, calculus for you kids. For those who are watching, can then see my uh, visual, my manual representations of, of that. So yeah, so yeah, so we do. And here's what's very interesting about it: is the story has Doom as the head of Latveria in the fifties, and according to other variations on Doom's origin, he actually didn't. He was actually still in Tibet at that time. Mm-hmm. So, because that was, because he doesn't become, doesn't start calling himself Dr. Doom until Reed Richards goes up into space and comes back as a celebrity. Everyone says, Dr. Reed Richards, Dr. Reed Richards. He's like, oh, call me Dr. Doom. Um, basically making it a meaningless honorific. What a villain would do, because he didn't do the work. No. He's no doctor. He's no doctor. That's all I'm saying. So, um, do you, you, you didn't want to talk Gunhawks? Uh, I want to talk about it a little bit because, man, I know we're running light on time, but I love Gunhawks um, yes. because it's a great take. It's a great way to tell a Western in the Marvel Universe that both takes what is our modern understanding of heroes and our modern understandings of the complex questions of the Western hero. Because essentially what we have is the the killer trying to make good. Which is a classic superhero story. This is basically the Otto Octavia story, mm-hmm. if you will. We meet our we meet Dean. He is the sheriff of this town. He's like one of these great gunslingers, preternatural aim, all that kind of stuff. Um, he has, but he has a dark past. He has a dark past that he doesn't want to talk about because apparently, uh, during the Mexican Revolution, he was a gun for hire and he was fighting for the people that they were revolting against. Um, fun fact about history, 
the people you think are the heroes aren't always the people that you're that you would necessarily identify with. Yep. Um, as, as I've always said, you know, we were actually on the side of the assassin in World War One. For those who for those who forget, uh, World War One was started by an assa- by a, essentially a terrorist killing Archduke Ferdinand. Uh, we were actually on the same side as that terrorist at when it all plays out at the end of the war. So, so the terrorist won. Uh, it's basically what the moral of World War One was. Uh, um, you know, has the has his best gal by his side, yada yada yada, and you get this idea of the soldadas, which is this all female group of uh, wild riders who, after they torch a town, because basically what happens is they go there, Pancho Villa's men weren't there, but things get out of hand and they wind up torching the town, and then the soldadas have committed themselves to killing every last person who was in there and you know it goes through its its entire story the soldados have oh there's there's the school um the soldados have tracked him down and they're going to kill his town if he doesn't give up he has killed he has shot their leader and he has been shot and they're in this spot and then he chooses to go with them to face his own punishment. Um, as his girls, like, Dean, we are at the same time. It's like, uh, I really am, I'm really am pleased with Dean as a character. I'm sad that we only get a one shot. Dead Man Donnelly. The Ballad of Dead Man Donnelly. That's the name of it. Um, I've gained a great love of Westerns recently watching, you know, old TV shows on broadcast TV. And, uh, yeah. I really liked it. I, I, I don't know. I, I thought it I thought it really captured that idea of you know, a person with certain skills who maybe did not always use those skills for good and now you're trying to do good and then your past comes back. And what is the right answer? And the answer is you face your sins. At the end of the day you face your sins to save everyone else because you know that the people that you wronged are going to make you pay for it. That's my thought there. Um <clears throat> Do you want to hit? Yeah. No, no. Do you want to hit anything else before we get out of here? Any other uh, issues? Well, I can. The only last thing is Captain America. I just want to say okay. I did not realize that we weren't following Hydra Cap like halfway through this book. I I, I didn't realize that it was split. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So when Cap's in prison, I'm part of me is thinking that that's Hydra Cap. Mm. Like when he's talking about Strucker, I, that seemed like something that Hydra Cap would be saying about Strucker too. And that's the thing. And so I kind of, it kind of threw me through. Oh no, that's right. He gets out early, and yada yada yada. <laughs> yeah, pardons can be out part of course. Thing. What do you, what do you think? That's intentional by Tanahasi Coates, or where you're like, wait, is this Hydra Cap or real Cap? No, I think it is exactly. I, of course, it's intentional, and I think it worked out very well. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. I really, ah, uh, God, yeah. This Tanahasi Coates, he's actually a pretty good writer. I don't know if anyone knows that. Uh, <laughs> you know. Uh, yeah, um, you find that a lot of people don't necessarily accept the whole it was that other cap thing. And then, for what it's worth, that other cap has a bad day. Um, because Celine meets up with him. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, I don't think that kills him, though. Mm-mm. No. So I don't know what is going to happen from this. I don't know where we go next. Maybe he is dead. Maybe Celine just jacked out his super soldier serum. But we'll have to see what happens. But then again, the last time you jacked out his super soldier system, all you get is old man Cap, and they've had that before too. Um, uh, I, I love the fact that the guy that they're getting, and this may be a well-established character, the foreigner, but just that he's called the foreigner is who, he, who is the actual killer. Is it, it's an interest, yeah. An old Spider-Man yeah. villain, yeah. No, I'm sure he is, but it's just such a... It's such a... It's such an on the nose name that I do mm-hmm. have to I, I have to give props that when Tana Hasi Coates is like, who should be the real villain? The foreigner. And it's just like when you think about the idea of the other and the fear of the other, it it, it makes for an interesting point that, you know, that fear is something you can harness. Harnessing he, the fear of the other is a thing you can do. He was basically around in the eighties. He was basically one of those guys, you know, if you needed like goons for your gang, you could like go to him and, you know, he rent goons or whatever and uh also i guess yes and like in some untold story i guess he's like the ex-husband of silver sable that is what they said apparently yes yeah. he's well you know she gets around you know she might have <laughs> had a husband at some point 
Yeah. Well, not, not to say, no, I mean, like, she travels the world. Yeah, and, yes, and He yes. lives a full life. People, you know, it's like Hollywood celebrities. You know, they get married, then they stop being married, you know, because they live these lives of adventure and travel. And, you know, you should. everyone should try it once, you know. <laughs> I guess. Maybe not. But certainly worked for her. Um, anyway, yeah, that was Captain America. Um, yeah, No Road Home was cool. Um, great take on Nightmare. As always, I do like Nightmare as a character. I like Rocket in this and Hulk. Hulk, I don't know. Well, Hulk, well, I don't know how I feel 100% about the current Hulk. You know, I'm a little like, mm, as a character, not the stories. The stories in Immortal Hulk are great, but the character, it's one of these moments where like a story can be good, but sometimes you're like, I don't know if I like your character. You know, I don't I know think- if you're a character I want to follow. Especially when it's not in the Immortal Hulk book, I think the writers are like have to like skirt this line of like you know keep it ambiguous. Like, oh, is this an evil Hulk now, or is it, you know? Yeah, yeah, and that is you know, and for what it's worth, I mean, you know, people have played with the Hulk Stark side before, especially with him talking about how dark he is. Yes, and the question becomes is, is where you go next with that. I also don't like Hawkeye necessarily being written down to. Mm-hmm. And we get a little bit of that in uh, in West Coast Avengers, but he's not big enough to like And he has to use the image inducer to be Simon Williams. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you can just call me Cl- uh, Simon. <laughs> yeah, Chris Simon. That 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 works. Um, <laughs> I was just waiting for them to be like, oh, oh, hey, uh, Mr. Williams, can you lift this car over your head? Uh, uh, <laughs> you know that'd be rude. Not for nothing. That's rude. You know, it's like the kid who comes up to George Reeves and says, "Hey, can I shoot you?" and have the bullets bounce off your chest. chest. Well, some, like, in, you know. some some kind of initiation thing or something, something where we need strength or vulnerability, and just be, I'm just waiting for like, a, um, uh. yeah. Well, maybe next issue because because yeah. the because the vampires are clearly onto them. Um, mm-hmm. Vampires. Are we still doing vampires? I wonder if that was like an editorial thing. They're like, "Oh, hey, Kelly, can you like tie this book somewhat into the other Avengers book?" So. Eh, a, I don't know. Give us a vampire. I think maybe she came up with the idea that there was going to be vampires, and like, oh wait, you're doing a big vampire arc there. And for whatever reason, Marvel editorial didn't say, "Oh, don't do vampires." We're doing the whole thing with vampires. Unless she's doing a thing with like you know how vampires don't age, and it's just like a Hollywood thing. It's like, oh yeah, I don't think there's been ho- vampires in Hollywood for years. Look at Tom Cruise. <laughs> uh, no, there you go. Uh, he was in an interview with a vampire, and he is oh, a vampire. So. Uh-huh. Entirely possible. I said, no, I gotta be. <gasps> I could see Tom Cruise just saying, no, I gotta go become a vampire. If I'm gonna do that. I have to know what it means to be a vampire to, to make this role real. Does his own stunts because he's not afraid of death. Exactly. Yeah. And that would be his first uh, stunt there. You know, he's gonna go, gonna go get bit by a vampire just so he can know what the story is. So there you go. Tom Cruise is a vampire. And I think he would appreciate being said, oh, you're so good as an actor. As as a as, as so dedicated an actor, you actually became a vampire just for that role of vampire with the stock. Um, when they do that next movie, they should just bring him back because again, ageless. You could clearly still play vampire with stocks. Him and Hugh Jackman. Oh, okay. Um, what else? Anything else to get through this week? We talked to Orville. I think we even talked to a little Gotham on this one. Yeah, we did. Uh, yeah, we did. Uh, oh, by the way, again, what I actually wanted to do honorable mention to Mister Scarface. Oh yeah, end, but man, that was great. And it's like one of these weird things that the that the guy who's using him is actually apparently a ventriloquist. Yeah, so he actually this is a thing he can do. It's like under his special skills. And like, I am also a ventriloquist. Um, that and it's like wow. So they've been planning this one episode since the start of it, or maybe again, like I said, that they got that one episode. They got these extra episodes, and they said, man, if only we had a guy on staff who was a ventriloquist. Well, actually, I'm a ventriloquist. Um, or actually, it's like, oh, wait, the guy we killed off three three episodes ago is a ventriloquist. Ah, bring him back. We bring people back from the dead all the time on this show. I mean, unless they just planned on him being a smaller part of the season, they're just like, oh, we got to fill an episode. You know, let's get, let's yeah. get Scarface. Well, and not for nothing, a lot of it was... So, you know, what's interesting is you might have had this as part of another episode. Mm-hmm. When you think about it, this is very much those scenes with, with Mr. Scarface are really much of a bottle episode. 
So you can make this strong argument that what they had was, oh, we, we were going to do the Jane Doe storyline because it ties into something that we're going to get back to with, with Hugo Strange. Mm-hmm. But now we have to make an extra episode. Another piece in the middle of this will create an unrelated piece that we can shoot in a scene with a couple of scenery tuner chewers like, oh, I don't know, the Riddler and Penguin, and <laughs> let them eat a nice, delicious meal. Um, so much so that we're going to actually introduce a character who's mute, who's going to die in that scene. Because we just need an extra body in the scene to fill it out. But yeah, you know, but don't get many lines, you know, but just get a big guy to not say anything. I think we can find that in Hollywood somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, and then they bring in that guy. And then, of course, they kill them both off. So everyone in that room, except for Joker and Penguin, is dead. So there's never a question why we never see them again. Yeah. So I think they literally took another episode that was about going to be about Hugo Strange that they'll then read it elsewhere, and they just stuck a whole other story in it to fill it out, <laughs> so they could get an extra three issues. And that's why it seems like a battle episode, even though it's actually about Harvey and Hugo Strange and other things about the nature of Gotham, because we do get our little Killer Croc reference in here. Mm-hmm. Um. The guy who's too far gone from the chemicals and his, his skin's messed up. It's not really Killer Croc, but kind of maybe a proto of that character. Um, and so we'll see where it goes next from there. But yeah, so good old honorable mention to Mr. Scarface, who was fantastic. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, but that's enough for this week, Phil. Unless you've got something else to say. Talking no. so much, Phil. Don't you know we're on a time schedule? No. <laughs> Uh, yes. Um, so nothing else to say? Okay, so Philip, give your social media. All right, everyone. Uh, if you want to get a hold of me, email me, nightwingpdp at gmail.com. On Twitter, I am at nightwingpdp. And uh, send us some emails at capesandlunatics at gmail.com. Uh, our next ep- episode 95 of uh, Capes and Lunatics is going to be our Captain Marvel review. So uh, go see the movie, send us your thoughts. We're going to be live on YouTube Sunday, Sunday, March 10th at 6 p.m. Eastern. A bunch of our friends are going to show up, so be there. Okay, and of course, you can always write to me in the old fashioned email way. There are my supposed one today at superconnectivityblog at gmail.com. That's superconnectivityblog, all one word, at gmail.com. Of course, follow me on Twitter. Say live tweet the Orville and Agents of Shield, which is going to come back eventually, and Cloak and Dagger, which is coming back very soon, and Gotham when I can until it's gone. At Charlie Esser, that's C H A R L I E S S E R. Like the two E's in the middle for quality. For quality. Ding. There you go. I actually cut you off that time. Uh, and uh, definitely, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to listen to this episode and the previous Capes and Lunatics episode where I'm using my cell phone. I want you to compare the audio, audio quality for Charlie Esser and then tweet me. Or email me and say, or if Phil, and say which was better so I know which technology to best employ. Vote. Next, vote, yeah. vote. Which was your favorite Charlie Esther? <laughs> anyway, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that has been Super Connectivity for this week. Please. Super Connect with us again, guys. Good night. Or good morning, depending on when you're listening. <laughs> good afternoon. Guten Abend. Auf Wiedersehen. <laughs> uh, that was a good episode, I think. They're all good. They're usually all good episodes. Yeah. Well, I gotta tell you something, Phil. Hmm. Don't look towards the board when they do the tweaked audio. I know. I try. You show another logo when you do that. No. Okay. Sorry. Charlie Esser <laughs> was right.